Please stand by. Good day and welcome to the Integrating Healthy Relationship Education in High School and College Call. Today's presentation is being recorded and at this time I'd like to turn the conference over to Stephanie Vester. Please go ahead. Thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families webinar focused on integrating healthy relationship education in high school and college. My name is Stephanie Vester and I will be assisting with this webinar today along with my colleague Trevor Hoffberger. So before we get to the agenda and the content for today's webinar, we are going to go through just a few webinar logistical items. Um, just so for everyone, uh, the webinar today will be an hour and a half ending at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Audio for the webinar will be broadcast through your computer, so please make sure your speakers and volume are turned on. If you have any technical issues throughout the webinar or problems seeing the slides or hearing the presentations, please send us a message in the Q&A pod that you should see located on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or feel free to call us at 1-866-916-4672 and we will be sure to assist you. Um, after the presentations today, we will have an online Q&A session we encourage you to type in questions you think of at any time while presenters are presenting by typing them in the Q&A pod. Again, it's located on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We will collect questions that are submitted and then address those during the Q&A session at the end as time permits. Um, if your question is for a specific presenter, please reference that when typing in your question if possible. Uh, throughout the webinar, you can browse our web links by clicking on any of the links in the web links pod in the top right-hand corner of your screen, and you can download materials by selecting files in the files pod on the right-hand portion of your screen. Uh, we will also be conducting several poll questions throughout the webinar that we really encourage you to participate in. So uh, we are very excited for the content that will be shared on today's webinar. As you can see, the webinar agenda includes several things, uh, logistics and brief introductions of our speakers, welcome and opening remarks, an overview of the Resource Center and its resources related to youth populations, a research overview linking family of origin to perpetrations of sexual assault, and a program example from the South Carolina Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy, and a Q&A session, as I mentioned before, that we will have following the presentation. So next up, um, we have our presenters for the webinar today. Um, first, we have Millicent Crawford. Millicent is a Family Assistance Program Specialist at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families Office of Family Assistance. And as part of her role, she oversees the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families. We have Robin Senesal. Robin is the project director for the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families. We have um, Evan Richardson. Evan is a doctoral candidate at the Department of Human Development and Family Science at the University of Georgia, where she studies family systems within high-stress contexts with a particular focus on the marital and co-parenting relationships of foster and adoptive parents, parents of a child with a disability, and military families. She is also interested in the resiliency of these families and how family life education may improve well-being. Um, and lastly, we have Shannon Lindsay. Shannon joined the South Carolina Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy in February of 2014 as the training coordinator. She is responsible for the development, planning, and implementation of all in-house, off-site, and online South Carolina campaign educational events. Um, before coming to the campaign, Shannon was the transition specialist for the South Carolina Vocational Rehabilitation Department and a statewide transition coach for the Office of Exceptional Children at the South Carolina Department of Education. So again, welcome to all of our speakers and thank you everyone for joining us on this webinar today. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our first speaker, Millicent, to get us started with some opening remarks. Good afternoon again, everyone. Um, again, my name is Millicent Crawford. I'm a Family Assistance Program Specialist 
within the Office of Family Assistance, the Healthy Marriage Responsible Fatherhood Program. So our program, the Healthy Marriage Relationship Education Program through our office, is designed to develop knowledge, to build relationship skills, and help improve behaviors that will ultimately enhance relationships and reduce problems affecting couples, individuals, and high school age students. Um, the Office of Family Assistance recognizes the importance of relationship building and getting started early with interventions with our youth so that ultimately we can try to mitigate problems from occurring in the future. So OFA is especially excited about our partnership with the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families. It's through their hard work and coordination of experts and other leaders in the field, through webinars and other information platforms like these that have a far and wide reach to many of our constituents, like many of you on the call today. The information that they share and the resources they provide serve to lift our office priorities, which ultimately is for our whole agency to improve the outcomes for children and families. And so with that being said, I'm going to pass it on to Robin Sinazal. Thanks, Melissa, and thank you for your support of the Resource Center. Um, welcome to all of you who have joined us today. I think you're going to really enjoy today's presentation. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit more about the Resource Center specifically. And uh, then I'm going to turn it over to our presenters and let them share some really exciting information with you. Let's get started with a poll question so that we have a better sense of who all is joining us today. So the question is, how familiar are you with the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families? And if you will just indicate on the poll whether you're very familiar, somewhat familiar, not at all familiar, or no votes. All right, great. So it looks like we have a, an interesting mix of participants today. A good number of you are somewhat familiar with the Resource Center. Some are very familiar. And then there are some new folks to the conversation today. So that's really great. I'm excited to have you folks joining us who have not been involved in some of our activities in the past. And I hope that you will visit the website. Uh, as You'll notice in the middle of your uh, screen there are some web links, one that takes you directly to the National Resource Center, another to our virtual training center, and there are also some files that can be downloaded down in the center, so I hope you'll take advantage of those. So the purpose of the Resource Center is to support ACF's mission, and we have two main purposes. We serve as a national repository for healthy marriage and relationship education. We gather, we develop, and we disseminate timely, relevant research tools and other resources on the topics that are of interest to a wide array of stakeholders, practitioners, researchers, and policymakers. Um, and we also provide training and technical assistance to human service agencies who are interested in actually integrating healthy relationship education skills into their programs as part of a holistic approach to strengthening families. So we have those kind of two sides of the house. We serve as a repository, and which brings up uh, an excellent time for me to mention to you, if you are aware of resources that should be in our library, please feel free to go to our website, and there is a library submission uh, process. Just submit those to us. We would love to, to add additional resources always to our library. So, through the Resource Center, we offer outreach um, through our conferences. We are on Twitter. You'll notice our hashtag down at the bottom corner of the slide, so please feel free to follow us on Twitter. Uh, and we also put out a monthly newsletter. If you sign up for our listserv, you will receive the monthly newsletter. You'll receive announcements about webinars. But we do try not to overload your inbox. Uh, we all get a lot of email ourselves, so we try not to do that. And we also develop stakeholder-specific products. We've developed over 60 products over the last few years um, that are stakeholder specific that really take excellent research like some of the information you're going to hear today and turn it into 
practical application information. So here's the research, here's what it says, and here's what you can do to apply this research in your program. And we think that that's really an important role that the Resource Center plays because there's tons of research out there. But if you don't actually have the mechanism to take and turn it into practical information, it's not so helpful sometimes. Um, I mentioned our training and technical assistance. We also offer state-level integration institutes. Um, and we're working with some of the TANF regional events uh, to help make sure that we're getting this information out as far and as wide as possible. We also have a technical assistance request form on our website. So if you could use support in integrating relationship education skills, let us know. Um, as I mentioned, our website has uh, tons of research-based resources in the library. We have the Virtual Training Center that has six courses available. And if you complete those courses, you can get um, a certificate of completion, which can be used for CEUs, which, by the way, we can now apply for a certificate of completion for participation in webinars. So that's an important point to keep in mind if you are someone who likes to collect credits for CEUs. Uh, we also have a media gallery. We realize that sharing information in different formats is important. We have some videos, some podcasts. Some of our videos have companion research pieces that go with them, which is indicated in the media gallery as well. And all of our webinars, as well as our newsletters, are archived. So you can always go back and catch up on something you missed. So I hope you'll do that. When we talk about healthy marriage and relationship education skills, the Resource Center focuses on four core skill areas. And we do this because these are the interpersonal skills like communication and conflict resolution. And these are skills that transfer from your interpersonal relationships within the family, couple relationships, parent-child relationships, to the workplace, to schools, to the community. So it's important to focus on those interpersonal skills and understanding that conflict resolution and communication are key skills in the workplace. Um, along with the critical skills, parenting and financial education. And we focus on these as critical skills because these are two of the number one stressors that impact families. Issues with parenting and children and finances affect families across socioeconomic lines. So we feel like these are really important skills to focus on. And all of these skills can be successfully integrated individually as, for example, a financial education class or a parenting class or collectively as part of a more holistic healthy relationship education program that can be beneficial in helping to reduce stress and improve communication um, in the workplace and in the home. So today, oh, where's my poll question? Here it is. So today we're going to talk specifically about integrating healthy marriage and relationship education into existing middle and high school programs. Um, we're going to talk about high school and college as well. But I want to hear from you guys. What do you think um, it can impact? Increase sexual acting out among middle and high school students? Decrease dropout rates among most at-risk students? Increase the likelihood that adolescents will be prepared to make wise decisions and handle relationship challenges? Or none of the above? need to get the Jeopardy music for the poll question. All right, looks like I didn't fool anybody with this question. 93% of you believe that it increased the likelihood that adolescents will be prepared to make wise decisions and handle relationship challenges. That is correct. As you'll see here in some of this information, um, relationship education really does matter to youth. Adolescents' early experiences with romantic relationships do frame their outlook on future relationships. And those who have more serious relationships in high school may actually perceive a greater likelihood of getting married. Um, integration in middle and high school programs has shown to increase adolescent preparedness to make wise relationship decisions and to handle relationship challenges effectively. And these interpersonal skills that are learned in healthy relationship programs at this age are also helpful in multiple contexts and situations. Think about um, communication and conflict resolution skills within the schools. 
when you think about issues of bullying and so forth. So being able to better communicate um, can be very helpful in a lot of ways for young people. Also, for high-risk youth, studies have indicated that uh, relationship education for high-risk youth has shown gains in relationship knowledge, skills, and positive attitudes towards couple violence. Um, increased relationship knowledge, also improvement in communication and conflict resolution skills, decreased the demand withdrawal and mutual avoidance patterns of communication, and also more likely to seek and engage in healthier romantic relationships. So all of these are important reasons for offering healthy relationship education for youth. And what you're going to hear from our presenters today, first you're going to hear from Evan, and Evan is going to share with you some really interesting research on the correlation of um, inconsistent parenting and issues with youth as they get older. And we're going to hear about how relationship education can actually be helpful to those youth as well as to helping parents better understand the importance of these issues whenever they're dealing with their kids. So I'm going to turn it over to Evan, and I will come back later and talk with you then. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, I am so excited to uh, uh, be speaking on this webinar today. Um, my name is Evan Richardson, and I am a doctoral candidate and a graduate research assistant at the University of Georgia um, in the Department of Human Development and Family Science. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about today is some statistics related to sexual coercion on college campuses, um, and then some family of origin experiences that research shows is related to sexual coercion. Um, I'm also going to be talking about some individual characteristics that has also been found to be related to sexual coercion. And then I'm going to be talking about a study that my colleagues and I here at the university um, worked on um, that we uh, found some really interesting uh, findings. And they, they're also going to be discussing the implications of those findings. And so we have another poll question. And so what percent of male college students report perpetrating sexual assault, if you were to guess? All right, so about 20%, 30%, 40%, or about 50%. All right, it looks like it looks like the majority of you um, thought about 20%. Actually, surprisingly, the number is about 50%. Um, about 50% of uh, male college students um, across research studies have uh, reporting perpetration, perpetrating sexual coercion. And that is surprising in that um, these are self-reports. And so we think that the actual number is actually a little bit higher than, than 50%. And so um, sexual coercion is the act of using pressure, substances, or alcohol, or force to have sexual contact with another person against their will. Um, so for an example, if an individual may get their date drunk or stoned with the intention of having sexual contact with them against their will, um, they may threaten to terminate their relationship um, if the other person doesn't agree to have sexual contact with them. There are various forms of sexual coercion um, that can be used. Um, and as, as we saw in the poll question, that nearly half of male college students report perpetrating sexual coercion of some sort. Um, and we, have also, we also know that approximately 30 to 50 percent of female college students have reported experiencing some form of sexual coercion, and 10 to 20 percent of female college students have reported being forced to engage um, in sexual intercourse. So in other words, they've been, uh, 10 to 20 percent have reported experiencing rape. Um, we know that uh, we know that sexual coercion is not always male to female, um, but we do know from research that it is a, a lot more frequent that the sexual coercion occurs from male to female, um, and we know that the consequences for the victim are uh, much more severe for females. Not to um, downplay sexual coercion against males. Um, because it's definitely also an issue, but we do know that it is more frequent um, when it's male to female. And so we know that victims of sexual violence often experience negative effects 
associated with the assault, um, including self-blame and psychological distress, um, embarrassment, trouble sleeping, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, alcohol and substance abuse, suicidal thoughts, lower self-esteem and lower sexual functioning. Um, so those are a lot of the negative effects, and they also might experience an unwanted pregnancy or a sexually transmitted infection. And so in addition to the negative effects for the victim, another concern of these high rates of sexual coercion is that uh, there is studies that show that there's an escalation of violent behavior of the perpetrator. So studies show that sexual coercion exists on a continuum and that perpetrators usually start with less violent strategies, such as using alcohol to apply their date. Um, but when these tactics fail, they might escalate to forceful violent behavior using verbal threats or physically overpowering their partner. So it is a, uh, a large concern on college campuses as well as other places. Um, and so researchers and policymakers and administrators have been trying to figure out some ways to learn more information about this to hopefully prevent these, um, these types of things from happening um, on multiple levels. And so one of the arenas that researchers have looked at is family of origin experiences. And so looking at interparental relationship quality and um, different uh, parenting behaviors. And so if we think about interparental relationship quality, we know from research that um, Hostility between parents is a possible family of origin factor that might be associated with the perpetration of sexual coercion later in life. And so if these um, young men are seeing their parents uh, using host having hostile interactions with one another, um, they're more likely to perpetrate sexual coercion. We know that um, interparental relationship quality impacts parenting quality um, and that parents who have high levels of hostile conflict do not have as much energy to put toward their child's needs. Um, we also know that parents who have high levels of hostile conflict are also likely to, to disagree about child rearing practices, um, which impacts their co-parenting relationship. And we also know that how parents interact with each other spills over into other parts of the family system. And so children and adolescents who observe the conflict in their parents' relationships are more likely to experience difficulty in their own relationships, whether it be their current uh, relationships. So if they're an adolescent and they have, they might be dating someone, they might um, experience difficulty in that relationship, but also with peers and siblings and other, other relationships that they have. And then it also impacts their future relationships, possibly with um, someone that they're dating during adulthood or a spouse. Um, and so, Adolescents who observe high levels of hostile conflict between their parents are more likely to experience high levels of, of aggression in their own romantic relationships. And they're more likely to believe that aggression is tolerable in those relationships and may use verbal or physical aggression um, to coerce a partner um, into sexual contact. So if we look at some of the parenting behaviors that, um, that researchers have examined when looking at these family of origin experiences, um, one of the ones that is most studied is harsh parenting. Um, and so when a parent-child relationship is characterized by harsh physical punishment or other harsh parenting behaviors, um, male offspring have been found to be more likely to perpetrate dating violence and sexual coercion during adolescence and young adulthood. Um, two uh, variables that haven't been studied as much are overparenting and inconsistent parenting. And so um, it's, it, overparenting has been a topic of interest in the media um, and in research in recent years. You may have heard it termed helicopter parenting. Um, I know there's a lot of articles and news reports in the popular media about helicopter parenting. But overparenting occurs when a parent is determined to create a happy, successful life for their child without taking into consideration their developmental needs. And so this might include overindulgence or overpermissiveness. Um, over-domineering or over-protection are just some forms of over-parenting. And over-parenting can be harmful to all children, but it's especially harmful um, in later developmental stages, so adolescence and young adulthood. Um, adolescents who are over-parented have been found to experience feelings of privilege and come to expect that they will receive what they want and that all problems will be solved for them. Um, research has suggested that over-parenting teaches a child to take and not to give, which leads to egotism, feelings of entitlement, and exploitation of others. 
and that adolescents and young adults who are overparented may come to feel that they are special and entitled to what they want, um, which might include sexual contact with an unwilling partner. And then the last um, parenting behavior that that has been looked at in research is um, co-parenting, that the co is inconsistent parenting, excuse me. Uh, the co-parenting relationship is a central component of the family system. Um, and so the co-parenting relationship is between, if the parents are married, is between the two parents, or it might include um, a mom and a grandmother or a dad and a grandfather. You know, it's the, the, the people that are involved in raising the child that are working together to raise the child. But that co-parenting relationship is separate from the couple relationship in that the co-parenting relationship only has to do with the child, um, making decisions for the child, all those types of things. And we know that it is a central component of the family system. And that consistency between parents um, is an important component of healthy co-parenting and has been found to be a central component of family functioning and child outcomes in many family structures. Um, including married parents, uh, foster families, um, divorced families, blended families. Um, and so in many family structures, research has shown that co-parenting, the co-parenting relationship is very important. Um, when dissimilarities in child rearing lead to inconsistencies between parents in responding to their children, we, um, we deserve triangulation, which is when one parent forms an alliance with the child and then undermines the other parent's authority, allowing the child to do something that the other parent disagrees with. And so when a child is inconsistently parented, um, they may lead to question the boundaries and expectations that are in place for their behavior. Um, they learn that while rules are strict with one parent, they can still break the parent's rules without consequences since the other parent allows them to do so. And so this, um, these types of behaviors can teach the child that no doesn't always mean no, um, and that the situation could be manipulated in order for the child to get their way. And in, young, in an adolescence or young adulthood, this um, may lead to the belief that they can manipulate a partner in a sexual contact, um, that no doesn't always mean no. Um, and so that is a parenting behavior that might be related uh, to perpetration of sexual coercion. And so then we also looked at the individual characteristics uh, of entitlement. And so when a child is taught that he or she is special, um, when they are taught that they don't have to solve their, um, their problems on their own, um, or when, they are, when a child is not held to a certain standard of behavior um, by the authority figures in his or her life, um, that the child may come to believe that he or she deserves special treatment and therefore may develop feelings of entitlement. And so... We know that entitlement is a major component of narcissism, um, and it involves the attitude that one is generally more deserving than others. Um, it's been found to lead to uh, greed and aggression, a lack of forgiveness and empathy, hostility toward others, and deceit. Um, and so with a lack of empathy, entitled individuals may feel that they deserve sex when they want it without considering the wants, needs, and desires of the other person. Um, narcissism and feelings of entitlement have been found to be associated with sexual coercion, um, especially date rape among college students. And those who feel entitled often use coercive measures to achieve a desired goal. Um, this can include sexual coercion of an unwilling partner um, if that partner is seen as an obstacle to achieving the desired goal of sexual contact. And so um, my colleagues and I at the University of Georgia, Dr. Leslie Simmons um, in the Department of Sociology and Dr. Ted Fugent here in the Department of Human Development and Family Science, conducted a study um, looking at these links between um, feelings of entitlement, uh, family of origin experiences, and the perpetration of sexual coercion um, for male college students. And so the purpose of the study was to better understand what family of origin experiences may be associated with the perpetration of sexual coercion in young adulthood, um, and then examine feelings of entitlement as a way to partially explain this relationship. And so we were interested in knowing whether family of origin experiences lead to the development of, sexual, of a sense of entitlement, and then if in turn this entitlement was related to the perpetration of sexual coercion. And so we used data from a sample of 326 male undergraduate college students to conduct this study. Um, this was quite a large survey, but the uh, items that were 
related to this particular study asked about the participants' observation of their parents' relationship quality when they lived at home, as well as their parents' um, interparental consistency while living at home. And then they were asked whether or not their parents did things for them that they could do for themselves um, during the last six months. So this would be over-parenting. So some examples of things they were asked were if their parents called to wake them up for class, you know, they're in college and they're not living at home anymore, and their parents are calling to wake them up for class, um, bought them things that they wanted that didn't necessarily need, um, might have put money in their bank account when they were about to overdraw, um, things that that either that didn't allow for natural consequences um, of behaviors like spending too much money or oversleeping for class. And then we also asked them about their feelings of entitlement and then about specific sexually coercive behaviors that they had um, engaged in. And so this study um, had several findings that uh, and, and implications that are important to understanding the potential impact of family of origin experiences on later perpetration. Um, first, this study found that uh, findings indicated that observing hostility between parents is directly associated with both feelings of entitlement and the perpetration of sexual coercion during young adulthood. Um, second, Overparenting during young adulthood was directly associated with feelings of entitlement, and then it was indirectly associated with the perpetration of sexual coercion through feelings of entitlement, which means that males who, were, who felt entitled because of being overparented were more likely to perpetrate sexual coercion. And then third, interparental inconsistency during the child's time at home was directly associated with feelings of entitlement and indirectly associated with sexual coercion through feelings of entitlement meaning that males who felt entitled because of their parents' inconsistent parenting were more likely to perpetrate sexual coercion. And so some implications that are important to uh, family life education. If we think about healthy marriage and relationship education, um, we know that conflict is normal in all couple relationships. Um, it's not whether you experience or don't experience conflict in your romantic relationship. Um, but how you manage the conflict that really matters, not only for the health of the relationship, but also for the well-being of children in the home. And so even when couples have conflictual interactions with each other in front of their children, parents who manage their conflict in a healthy way model healthy conflict management um, to their children, which can strengthen the child's healthy relationship skills. And so since hostility between parents has been found to be associated with both feelings of entitlement and the perpetration of sexual coercion, among other, other negative outcomes, um, those who are providing healthy marriage and relationship education to parents, whether that be um, through a social del uh, service delivery system or through um, family life education or other programs, um, these facilitators should emphasize the importance of healthy conflict management and then teach participants skills and strategies to use when inevitable conflict arises. Uh, reducing hostility and increasing warmth between parents, even for co-parents who, who are no longer in a romantic relationship, um, this has strong implications for the well-being and future behaviors of their children. And so, so social service providers in relation to parent educators who work with separated or divorced parents should also discuss the importance of overall health of the co-parent relationship, whether it's romantic or not, and that co-parents who are in a healthy relationship and practice healthy communication and respect for one another are more likely to be better co-parents. Um, and then putting up a united front um, is really important, and having that consistency for children is very important. Um, letting your child know that you work together as a team when it comes to decision making about what they do and in all households, whether parents are married or not, um, just allows a child to know that, that they can't coerce one parent into giving in when the other parent said no. So when children know that both of their parents are on the same page um, and the parents work together as a team to make child rearing decisions, and then the parents are also committed to never undermining their co-parent, um, children learn that coercive measures, such as going to the other parent for a different answer, will not be fruitful. 
um, which will reduce their likelihood of, use, of using coercive measures later in life, including with um, romantic partners. And then finally, if we think about relationship education for adolescents and young adults, um, we think that it can reduce the frequency of perpetration of sexual coercion. Um, I know that Shannon is going to be talking about this a little bit later, um, but it's important to understand that relationship education for young people should emphasize the difference between a healthy relationship and an unhealthy relationship, and that healthy relationships are not ones that include coercion. Um, it should also emphasize the importance of healthy conflict management and respect for one another's boundaries in all areas, including the sexual relationship, and pointing out that aggression is never acceptable in romantic relationships, um, and that will also emphasize the importance of this respect. And then as far as um, implications for parenting education, um, providing parents with strategies for healthy, authoritative parenting is an important implication of this research. Um, parent educators should teach parents how to establish rules that both parents will stick to, um, teach them how to work together as a team, and provide consistency and boundaries for the child. And so when both parents agree not to override a decision made by the other parent in front of the child, the parents are putting up a united front and telling the child that they are working together as a team. And so clearly establishing behaviors and standards, uh, standards of behavior and boundaries, um, explaining the reason for those rules to their children, and then explaining the consequences that there are for violating those rules. And then uh, applying the rules and respond to violations in a consistent manner. Those are some things and some strategies that parents should be taught um, in order to create consistency in the home. We know that authoritative parenting allows for verbal give and take between the parent and the child, um, but that the parent should retain authority in the relationship. Um, parents may choose to relax a certain rule in certain situations. Um, for example, if the parent extends the curfew because a, a bus is getting uh, back late from an away game, for an example. Those are things that are logical, and we know that um, parents might relax their rules. So by creating an environment of consistency between parents, um, parents do not allow the child to coerce his parents into giving into his, into his request, teaching them that coercive strategies are not acceptable. And then as far as overparenting, I know that a lot of I know that most parents want their child to be happy and healthy and they want to give support to their children. But parents often, while they're behaving with the best intentions, it's important to help them understand the unintended, the unintended consequences of some well-intentioned behaviors. And so while it's common to want to keep one's offspring from experiencing hardship, sometimes it's developmentally appropriate to allow them to experience the natural consequences of their actions. And so just teaching parents that what's developmentally appropriate is a really important implication of this research. And so now I'm going to be turning it over to Shannon Lindsay to talk about teen pregnancy prevention. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Um, so as Evan told you, my name is Shannon Lindsay, and I'm the training coordinator at the South Carolina Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy. My part of today's presentation is, <clears throat> is to discuss how the South Carolina campaign has integrated healthy relationship education into our current work. Um, but first, I feel like I should give you all just a little bit of background about the South Carolina campaign. Um, our mission as an organization is to improve the health and economic well-being of individuals, communities, and the state of South Carolina by preventing teen pregnancy. Our approach um, we call the four C's, communication with our target market, customization of our approaches, capacity building at all levels of the community, and commitment to research and evaluation and a long-term investment. Um, we have excellent news to report. Um, we actually just released the most recent teen pregnancy data here in South Carolina um, back in December. Um, and since we've been collecting this data, South Carolina has seen 
a 61% decrease in the teen birth rate. Um, <clears throat> so for, I guess that's what, 23 years. So from 1991 to 2014, we've seen a 61% decrease in our um, teen birth rate. And um, that's certainly something to be celebrated. Um, in particular, when you look at the population of 15 to 17 year olds, that decline has been more dramatic. Um, it's declined 71% since it peaked in 1991. What you'll see on this graphic, though, is our hashtag um, for this year, and it says start early, stay late SC. And what that, what that says and how that relates to, um, to our work is that in South Carolina, um, births to, to young women ages 18 to 19, um, older teens, is what drives our birth rate. Um, so we've done an excellent job in targeting the population that is in school, um, in middle and high school. Um, it's those young people that are leaving school and moving into adult life but are still not um, technically um, not teens um, that are, are still uh, driving our birth rate. And so we have some strategies um, to help us stay late, so to continue to provide education and access to those young people um, that are driving our rate. That brings me to my first poll question, and I'm going to, um, there it is, hopefully it'll appear on the screen. And my, my poll question is, as of 2014, what is the rate of teen births per 1,000 teens in the United States? Wonderful, it looks like a lot of you um, are, <laughs> are um, experts on the teen birth rate. You're absolutely right. The um, teen birth rate in the United States is 24.2. That is 24.2 births to young people ages 15 to 19 per 1,000 teen girls. That's the way that statistic um, is reported. What you'll see on your screen um, is a comparison between South Carolina and um, the United States data. Um, I've already mentioned our 61% um, decrease in birth rate here in South Carolina. That line um, is the blue line on top. Um, there's been a 10% decrease in the birth rate just in the last year that data was available, so that would be 2013 to 2014. The yellow line is the U.S. teen birth rate. Um, what you'll see, I hope, is that South Carolina, although um, we have a higher rate, we are keeping up with the decline um, that the entire United States is having. And um, there, uh, the, the full United States decrease in the last year was 9%. So we actually exceeded um, the um, decrease in the United States as a whole. The difference between our birth rate here in South Carolina and the U.S. birth rate is actually the smallest that it's ever been um, since we started collecting this data. And that's a lot for us to celebrate. However, we know we still have a lot of work to do here. And that's part of what I'm going to be talking with you um, about today. So the South Carolina campaigns role is to build capacity across our state to do the work of teen pregnancy prevention. Um, we do that through um, these strategic imperatives that you see here on the screen. Um, these strategic impairments, uh, imperatives, excuse me, uh, increase engagement to maximize impact, impact systems to create sustainable change, push innovation to respond to a changing environment, and be accountable to our mission and best practices. These imperatives are what drive our work. And it's through these imperatives that we believe that we can continue to decrease the teen pregnancy rate in South Carolina. Um, <clears throat> that takes us to our next poll question. And so my question to you is, which strategy, what strategy or strategies does the South Carolina campaign currently use in its teen 
uh, pregnancy prevention work here in our state. Ah, you all got me too. So um, you'll see, you'll see there's several different um, strategies here, and in fact, we use all of the above um, as our, um, as we do our work here in South Carolina. So the next slide is an overview of a two-year study um, that concluded um, this time last year. Um, it was conducted here in South Carolina with the support of the Duke Endowment. And it was a first of its kind study to determine a path forward to teen pregnancy prevention efforts that would maximize resources and target communities most in need. Uh, taking a nod towards the technical package approach that's been put forth by the Centers for Disease Control, and, and that technical package um, approach uh, is described as effective public health programs consist of a limited number of high-priority, evidence-based strategies packaged together for maximum effect. Um, the South Carolina campaign proposes the technical package that you see on your screen. So these four evidence-based strategies are designed to decrease teen pregnancies by promoting abstinence and the consistent use of effective contraceptive methods, including condoms, among sexually active youth. So the, that package consists of widespread implementation with fidelity of evidence-based teen pregnancy prevention programs, um, an expanded availability of quality teen-friendly family planning services for adolescents, that includes access to LARCs, and LARCs stands for Long-Acting Reversible Contraceptives, um, uh, increasing the number and the utilization of teen-friendly condom access points in local communities, and improving the educational and information offerings for parents to increase parent-child communication about relationships, love, and sex. And it's really in that fourth um, piece of this technical package that our um, focus will be on um, today. So the campaign participated in an integration institute here in South Carolina right about this time last year. It was actually the 12th of February last year. And um, the folks that came to the table were uh, a, a, a wonderful group of individuals who have previously worked together in some capacity. They included um, members of uh, an organization in our state called the Children's Trust, um, our, um, our Fatherhood Initiative in South Carolina, um, our Health and Human Services Agency, um, SCADVASA, um, which is our South Carolina coalition of um, domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, so there, were, there was this very diverse group of folks together. And what happened here at that campaign as a result of our participation in that Integration Institute is we brought Robin back to South Carolina. Um, she was here in February last year. We asked her to come back. And she came and spent some time with us in June and presented at our um, annual Summer Institute. Our Summer Institute is one of the largest teen pregnancy prevention conferences in the United States. Um, it's high quality, something that I take a great deal of pride in, and um, it was wonderful to have Robin come and present to our local partners um, all across the state about the importance of integrating healthy relationships in their work with young people and parents. Uh, we also have a Third Thursday webinar series. Um, every Third Thursday um, of each month, we um, produce a webinar. And over the last year, we've integrated content about healthy relationships and some content about identifying what unhealthy relationships look like, because I think that's a huge component of understanding what healthy looks like. You have to know what unhealthy looks like as well. 
Um, so we've had webinars on reproductive coercion among youth. We've had um, a webinar on the impact of alcohol and drugs on sexual risk-taking behavior for young people. We've had a webinar on trauma-informed care. We've had a webinar on sexual trafficking here in South Carolina. In December, we had a webinar on sexting and cyberbullying. And this month, um, so that will be next Thursday, if anybody's interested in joining us, we actually have a webinar on effective co-parenting. So you're hearing me mention several of the strategies that Evan um, mentioned in her research, and they're things that um, we've picked up on and have tried to um, integrate into our work to provide good quality uh, information and resources to our partners here in South Carolina. We've also, as an organization, spent some time learning and better understanding the ACES study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, and we've integrated some of that information into our training. And um, we've gotten great feedback from that and have, um, have, have in our minds to continue to do that. Um, we have also conducted some trainings in our state with foster parents and youth services providers that have been focused on improved communication with young people and specifically on the concepts around being an askable adult. Um, that's important because as an agency, we don't do a lot of work directly with young people. Our focus has usually been on um, the adults and service providers that work with young people. And so being able to actually touch parents and foster parents um, in particular with this content has been a wonderful opportunity. Um, we've had, through our participation in the PrEP uh, grant, and PrEP is the Personal Responsibility Education Program. Many of you are probably familiar with that. Um, that is supported by uh, FISB. Um, healthy relationships ha are one of six uh, components, um, three of which have to be integrated into the work of the PrEP grant in your, in your state. Um, and so we've been very fortunate that we've, we've worked on, um, on the PrEP grant and have focused through that grant on several evidence-based interventions, or EBIs we call them, for teen pregnancy prevention that already incorporate um, healthy relationship components. And we're looking um, in 2016, 2017 at having a more intentional focus on that aspect um, as well. We focused on and emphasized the relationship and communication components in the evidence-based curricula trainings that we do all over the state as well as having improved conversations both internally and externally with partners about healthy relationships and the impact on teen pregnancy and teen pregnancy prevention. Um, I mentioned SCADVASA, the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. They actually presented one of those Third Thursday webinars, um, as has the Sexual Trauma Services of the Midlands. So we've seen an increase in collaboration and shared training around concepts that are supportive of healthy relationship education. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention, although you won't see a slide on it, that we've collected resources and shared them on our Youth Focus website. We have a website called notrightnowsc.org. Um, there is a component on that website specifically for young people, um, and it focuses on helping them have conversations with their partners about initiating uh, or abstaining from sexual behavior. Um, the model that's there is think about it, talk about it, and make a plan. And there are resources on that website that we um, share with young people all across the state to help them have conversations with their partners. 
Um, at its heart, our work is based on those conversations and based on empowering young people to take a, a role in um, their decision making about um, engaging in sexual behavior. We certainly um, believe and, and share that abstinence is the best way to prevent an unplanned pregnancy, but if you're going to be sexually active, it should be um, within the confines of a healthy relationship. So um, that's how the work has been moving here in South Carolina. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Stephanie for questions. Thank you so much, Shannon. So I just want to remind everyone on how to ask a question. You can uh, ask a question by typing it in the Q&A pod that's located on the bottom right corner of your screen and clicking enter. So we are just going to wait a couple minutes to give participants time to submit questions for all the presenters and then we'll move over to our Q&A session. So if you have a question, feel free to type it in now. Okay, our first question is for Evan, um, and the question reads, why did you choose to use the term sexual coercion, um, and what is the difference between using that term and saying sexual assault or rape? Thank you for your question. Um, so the reason we chose sexual coercion is because the, uh, the measure that we used in our study measures sexual coercion and not um, and not rape or sexual assault. And so it does measure that, but not only that. Um, and so the, uh, some of the questions that were, uh, or some of, yeah, some of the questions that were used in the survey were asking things that didn't necessarily lead to sexual intercourse, but other sexual contact. Um, and so that is why, and it was using verbal, um, like maybe, uh, verbal things like threatening to terminate their relationship, um, that sort of thing. And so it wasn't always um, sexual assault or rape. Um, and so that is why we use the term sexual coercion, because it's more of an umbrella term for the questions that we ask. Great, thanks. Okay, and we, and we have another question that's come in, and it's for Shannon. The question reads, have you seen teen pregnancy prevention strategies change with social media? That's a great question. Um, actually, I was sitting here as Evan was talking, thinking through how social media um, actually might even impact her work. Um, I, I definitely think uh, that some of the um, teen pregnancy prevention efforts have changed. Um, there are a lot more um, resources available online um, and available through social media. Um, we, in a, a previous project, when we um, conceived of and developed our, our youth-focused uh, uh, website, not right now, sc.org, um, we did a lot of our um, advertising through social media and <clears throat> continue to do that. We've seen some great results out of um, North Carolina for a project that, that they have using a text line to provide information to young people. Um, so I definitely think there's been uh, a change and I, I honestly think that we can use social media to our advantage. Um, we can leverage it to provide information to young people in new and novel ways and ways that they access more readily because there's a level of anonymity to it, um, which obviously comes with social media. So I hope that answers your question. Um, I do think it's changed. I, I think it's um, change the way young people relate to one another um, and 
you know, I, I certainly think that we'll continue to see that impact um, on our work uh, as we move forward. Young people today, m much to my chagrin and dismay, are not at all like young people were um, when I was young. I have a 13-year-old daughter, and she's growing up in a very different world than I did. And social media is responsible for that um, in many, many ways. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is back to Evan. Um, in addition to educating parents, can healthy relationship education be incorporated on college campuses for students who may already be experiencing feelings of entitlement? And do you think it would be in helpful for them? Absolutely. Um, I am a firm believer that healthy relationship education makes, can make a huge difference in, some, difference in someone's life and the way that they think and the way that they behave. Um, and so I think that um, that, that might be a good way to, um, to maybe prevent some of, these, some of these occurrences of sexual coercion. Um, I actually haven't thought about that uh, in, de in detail, but I think that um, providing healthy relationship education and providing the, uh, the strategies to dealing with these feelings of entitlement and what that actually means and, how, and changing how we behave um, could make a huge difference on college campuses, yes. Thanks. Um, our next question is open to anybody. Um, and it reads, what is the best way to approach a local public high school about relationship education for youth? Um, I'll, take, I'll take part of it. Um, my hope is that uh, depending on what state you're in, that you have um, laws or state standards for health education that mandate in some way that young people are receiving um, comprehensive sex education. And so um, from, from certainly from the, my perspective, the approach would be um, through uh, whomever the coordinator is in the district of the, the um, health and wellness education in, in the district to ask. Are you using a curricula? Is it evidence-based? And does it integrate um, a healthy relationship information? Uh, here in South Carolina, our, um, our uh, domestic violence and sexual assault organizations provide healthy relationship training in our school districts. And um, so there's already a mechanism for an, an inroad into some of these organizations, into some of these districts, but that might be a place to start. Evan, I don't know if you or Robin have any other um, suggestions for that. Um, I. Based on another project that I've worked on here at the university, um, here in Georgia they are uh, implementing relationship education with sex education in some of the um, in some of the school districts. And so, I mean, we know that in a lot of states that sex education is happening in the high schools um, and in the middle schools. But I think that this is that's the perfect place for relationship education to be included. Um, Robin, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but I think that you know maybe approaching a school or a school district with the suggestion of integrating it with a sex education. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that, that that's helpful, and that students um, that their well-being is increased and their their strategies for having a healthy relationship increase. This is Robin. I would just add that there are a number of states who have integrated relationship education skills into their high schools. Um, for example, Utah has integrated, and they have a specific curriculum that is taught consistently throughout the high schools. Um, in terms of how to approach, each school district in each state are slightly different. So uh, what I have heard from some is that the best place to start is to start with a principal at a school. But that works in school districts where principals have a little more flexibility in terms of how things are done. Um, in other 
districts, it's more important that you start with the school board, for example, and get the school superintendent on board with what you're trying to offer. Um, in some states, we've found that uh, family life education, what used to be called home ec, those classes are another uh, venue for offering healthy relationship education skills versus just the health classes. Um, some of the challenges in some states is that healthy relationship education may be offered, but it's often offered as an elective, and it's not always seen as the cool class, uh, so it doesn't always um, get as much interest from some of the young people. So marketing is a big piece of how are you going to sell the idea first to the school, but also to engage the young people and get them interested in participating. We do have some resources on in the virtual library uh, that talk about Utah and also the PAPA curriculum, which has been integrated into high schools in Texas, so you might want to check those out. Great, thanks. Okay, our next question is actually a two-part question for Shannon. Um, the first part, uh, someone asks how to sign up for the Third Thursday webinar series. And the second part is how does South Carolina share information about their youth website and what info do they find is the most popular? Great questions and obviously as the training coordinator, I'd love to have you join us next week. Um, you can visit our webpage um, and uh, our corporate webpage is uh, teenpregnancysc.org. Um, and if you go to our events and trainings page, uh, you can scr scroll down there and find uh, next week's webinar, click on register, register, and join us next week. We'd love to have you. <coughs> um, can you repeat the second part of that question? I sure can. Um, how does South Carolina share information about their youth website, and what information do they find is the most popular? Um, okay. So we do a lot of, um, have done, I should say, a lot of marketing. The website was um, a byproduct generated from our most recent um, Center for D Disease Control grant that just wrapped up um, at the end of September of 2015. We developed and tested the website in two communities and then shared um, that information through uh, youth leadership teams in both communities. We've been very fortunate to be the recipient of two new federal grants that began on October 1st. And in both grants, we have youth leadership teams as a component of the local um, organizations that are partnering with us. So um, we share the website with those young people. We actually have, um, are in the initial stages of planning a youth summit this summer. We will be bringing in uh, representatives from all of those youth teams, and I suspect, although I can't promise, but I suspect um, a good bit of that will include public, um, publicizing the availability of notrightnowsc.org. Um, we have tons and tons and tons of what we call here at the campaign swag. We give away a lot of stuff that has our um, website uh, address on it and, and lots of information that's been published and created in youth-friendly ways. Um, every year in May, we do what we call um, a road show, and we, we take our, our work on the road and we um, spend time in local communities and in local school districts Last year we had some fantastic presenters and their goal was to, um, to work with young people around our Not right, right Now um, SC.org um, website. We use social media, we use Twitter, um, we use um, iHeartRadio uh, and Spotify. We do ads on a lot of um, those uh, platforms as well. Um, as a way to generate um, knowledge and drive folks to the website. Um, and to tell you which parts of it are, are the most popular, honestly, I can't tell you that. Um, I, I'm not responsible for the website, but I know it gets um, lots and lots of hits. 
Um, I suspect that um, we, we have a clinic locator on our um, on that website. I suspect that might be um, a fairly popular option on the website. Um, but it doesn't tell me when, when I look and see who's been, I can't tell if it was a young person or an adult. And I certainly visit it quite regularly. So um, every time I go, it counts me again. Um, but there's tons of information there. There's information there for parents as well. Um, and so we send parents there too. Uh, our goal is to help, help parents have open, honest conversations about relationships, love, and sex with their young people. And the best way to do that is to initiate a conversation, not have a talk, but actually have a conversation. Um, we've done lots of um, public awareness campaigns across the state as well with that Not Right Now logo. So um, hopefully it's been fairly well saturated and people know it. And if they don't, that work will continue. Great. Thank you, Shannon. And I just want to point out that we have added the link to teen pregnancy uh, sc.org to the web links section of the webinar. So if you'd like to sign up um, for that third Thursday webinar series, you can access it through that site. Our next question um, is actually going to stay with Shannon, and Robin, you may chime in as well. Um, could you say more about the integration of adverse childhood experiences into trainings? How did it come about? And what has been the response? Um. So I talked a little bit about it, um, the training that we've done with, um, with foster parents and with youth service providers. Um, we call that training Askable Adult. And we've modified the training and now have two versions of it. It's based off some work that came out of um, New York. And we've adapted it and modified it for South Carolina. And we've done this. Um, it's a, it's a full day. It's six hours. We've done it so many times, and every time we've done it, we've changed it a little bit. And when we started working with foster parents, what we realized was that foster parents are, are foster parents for a reason. They want to provide love and safety to a young person who um, has not maybe not had that. Uh, but what we heard from those foster parents was that they didn't understand why kids were, were so isolated or cold or removed, especially teenagers. And so part of what we did was we stepped back and said, okay, well, why might that be? Why might, why might you be seeing resistance or anger? Um, and so we came back to um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and adverse childhood experiences. Um, you know, that study is, gosh, I don't even know how many years um, old it is, but it's, it's been around for a good long while from Kaiser Permanente out in California. Um, we've had uh, Dr. Dave, David Walsh here to talk about parent-child connectedness, and he talked about adverse childhood experiences, and that piqued my interest. And I have a wonderful coworker, Dana Becker, who was also interested in um, this information, and she and I uh, delved in a little bit, learned a little bit more, and then thought, you know, it makes sense when we talk to folks about why you might see resistance in a young person, in a, in a teenager, particularly um, if that young person is in the foster care system, that they may be trying to meet a particular need um, in that hierarchy, and they have been exposed to some level of trauma, so our um, our understanding of them may not be fully well developed. And so um, the last time we did the training when we presented those two pieces together, we got the best results we've ever gotten, um, and it will be something that we continue to do. Um, it, it has helped us too, um, all of us here at the campaign, develop a better understanding of why young people may seek love and acceptance through sexual behavior. Um, and uh, you know, there's just there's so much about it that just sets the light bulb on um, in my mind when I think about um, some of the reasons that, that that young people find themselves in sexual relationships at young ages, and um, you know, pre either pregnant or parenting at young ages. Thank you. Um, 
I have another question that is open to anybody. Do you know of any evaluations of marriage and relationship education programs for youth that specifically look at the impact on avoiding violence in future relationships? This is Robin. I, um, I believe that Healthy Relationships California just recently did um, some analysis of data on early interventions and healthy relationship education for youth. I am not sure if it specifically talks about um, the research as it relates to preventing violence, but I would imagine that that's probably in there. Um, they are, they have been a, a healthy marriage grantee, and um, if anyone is interested in their contact info, if you'll email me, I'd be happy to get it for you. But I know that they just recently did a really nice um, piece on analysis of data as it relates to healthy relationship education and youth. Great. So I think that is all of the questions we have for speakers. So I think uh, what we will do now is um, go ahead and just move over to closing remarks. Um, so Robin, I want to turn it over to you for closing remarks, but I did just want to let everyone know that um, as the webinar concludes, we do have a brief survey that's going to pop up on your screen. So please remember to provide your feedback uh, using the survey as it really helps us in planning for future webinars. And I also wanted to just mention um, Robin talked about this before, but um, once you do complete the survey, there is a link for you to print out a certificate of completion for today's webinar for CEUs. So if you're interested in that certificate, then you need to make sure you complete our survey um, at the end of the webinar. But I will now turn it over to Robin for some closing remarks. Thanks, Stephanie, and thank you to all of our presenters today. Evan, Shannon, thank you so much for the information, and Millicent, thank you for joining us and for OFA's support of this work. It's really exciting to me to hear in today's presentation how it really kind of connects the dots around the importance of healthy relationship education for couples and healthy relationship education as it relates to parent-child relationships and the parenting component and how it really is kind of a circular sort of situation. Um, we heard Evan talk about a lot of these behaviors that are um, manifesting themselves on college campuses are the result of things that took place in the family of origin. And we know that that's typically where people learn how to have relationships, how to communicate, how to resolve conflicts, how to parent, um, even, and how to manage their money. And so without having positive behaviors modeled for them, they're going off into the world with less than positive um, behaviors. And I love the idea of healthy relationship education skills on college campuses as a way to reduce sexual coercion, not just for those uh, young people who feel that they are entitled and need to change their behaviors, but for those who might be the victims of the coercion to better understand what healthy relationships are supposed to look like so that they understand that they, even if they grew up in an environment where that type of behavior was acceptable, that it is not acceptable in a healthy relationship. So I, so I love that. And I love how Shannon talked about engaging parents and encouraging parents to have honest conversations with their young people about healthy relationship and um, sexual behaviors. Um, so I think it's really very, very timely information. We are working on a research to practice brief based on the research that Evan talked about, and that will be coming out soon, so everyone stay tuned for that. Um, but really what we've got to do with this work as we try to move it forward is we've got to change the culture. We live in a society where professional development is, is revered. People you know, appreciate whenever people go for professional development, but the idea that you might go to a parenting class or a healthy relationship class or a healthy marriage class it's perceived as if there must be something wrong. We've got to change that culture and make these skills available in 
ways and in places that are non-punitive where families can access parenting education without feeling like there must be something wrong with me because I want to go to a parenting class. And I think that really is the work that we need to be kind of doing, um, continuing the great work that's happening in South Carolina and continuing to feed the research into practice so that we can do a better job of all of this kind of stuff. Um, so that's really, I so appreciate everyone joining us and staying with us throughout the webinar today. Uh, I'll give Millicent a chance if you'd like to say anything um, before we wrap up and then we'll go to the survey. Again, I just want to thank everyone, um, the speakers and all of the participants on the call today. And again, um, this just represents um, OSA's um, quest for knowledge, quest for healthy um, families and children. And this is just one example of what OSA is doing um, through the National Resource Center to try to promote and um, change and help children and families. So thank you again for everyone who was on the call and all of our speakers. Thanks. And thanks to Stephanie and Trevor, too.